hopefully that will seamlessly come over to me in real life as opposed to the recorded version of me there. Um, I hope you didn't have, I had experienced some slight audio issues on there. I hope that wasn't the case um, for everybody. But hopefully that's given a, a bit of an introduction that will help to spark some um, some discussion around our, our panel sessions around drilling and agronomy barriers specifically for this section. And we'll talk about harvest, um, harvest and processing barriers and solutions after we've had um, coffee. So we've got about the next 45 minutes or so um, to talk um, with our panel. I'm going to ask our panel to introduce themselves uh, in a moment. We're very lucky to have um, for industry experts um, along um, to answer questions that we've, you might have. And if you've got any, please pop them in the chat. I've seen a few, um, few coming in there already specific to what the work I was talking about with the Clover at STC. Um, and we've also got a few that we're very grateful have been sent in um, ahead of time as well. So I'll start with those while you're populating the, the chat box there with some further questions. But first of all, um, I'd like to introduce um, our panel, or rather ask our panel to introduce themselves. Um, we have Andrew Howard, Doug Christie, Graham Rowe and Andrew Manfield. Um, and I'll ask each of those in turn to give a couple of minutes talking about how they're engaged with plant teams, what sector they're from, whether it's farming or whether it's machinery development, um, and really the um, where they are with plant teams um, at the moment, how they're using them on their farm or trying to support them with some of the machinery solutions they might be working on. So first on my list, um, Andy Howard, if I could start with you, please. Afternoon. Um, yeah, quick introduction. Um, farmer from Kent, um, family farm, about 300 hectares. Um, I did my first uh, foray into companion cropping, into cropping in, I think, 2012, 2013. I did a 24-metre strip of... Um, uh, all seed rape with um, vetch and um, buckwheat. Um, that was from listening to Frederick Thomas of um, Base France, and it sort of sparked an interest. It was an idea that I'd never even considered before putting two crops in the same field at the same time. Um, from that led on um, to doing a Nuffield scholarship in 2015, studying this exact subject of intercropping and companion cropping. Um, and from that, I've come home since, and we've been trialing different uh, teams. Um, some we've tried be peas, peas and oilseed rape, um, beans and oats, uh, lentils and oats, peas and oats, um, linseed and oats, um, various various teams that we've trialed and um, grown commercially on the farm. Um, we're still doing plenty of trials and learning as we go along. Um, in terms of machinery for intercropping, um, three years ago, I bought a secondhand cross slot drill. Um, the reason being it had three hoppers on it, so I could put three different seeds in, and it also has the ability to plant at two different depths, um, which really opened up um, possibilities for um, doing things with different types of seed or big difference in seed like peas and all seed rape and allowed me to plant them in one go um, instead of having to cross the field twice. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. And I'll pass on to the next person. Excellent, thanks very much, Andy. Next on my list, Doug Christie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I farm up in Fife in Scotland um, on roughly 500 hectares, of which a third of that is organic, but that's mainly livestock based. But um, I have been doing intercropping, and many people probably have with under sowing barley, which is with clover and grass. So um, for quite a few years. And um, but like Andy, I was. Um, I was intrigued about how to grow um, on, in growing cro different crop species in the same field after um, listening to Frederick Thomas and going out to the States and seeing what some farmers are doing out there and the benefits of having as many species in the field as possible, as pra practically possible. So um, I've tried um, peas and barley, um all seed rape and vet spring all seed rape, rape and vetch um beans and oats um 
peas, oilseed, rape, and oats together, a three-way mix, which actually worked, worked quite well. Um, but the main reasons for doing it to be able to reduce inputs. And, um, and it's amazing how green some of these cereal crops are in the third position in a rotation. So I, I use my, my companion crops in the, in the break part of the rotation. So I have two years of cereals and then I have a, um, my companion crops. Nearly all my break crops now are companion crops. And um, it's amazing how much nutrient uptake the cereal element of the, um, of the equation can take up. I would never be able to do that if I grew a monoculture cereal. Um, so it, and also pests and diseases and weeds are drastically reduced, but not, it's still quite tricky. It's quite complex, but um, it's, it seems to be working and, um, the advantages, are, the advantages are there, I think. I haven't cracked the nut by any stretch of the imagination, but um, there's a long way to go. Excellent, thanks very much, Doug. Over to Graham Rowe. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I work uh, for a machinery manufacturing company who deal mostly with the trials industry. So any of the seed companies that are looking at uh, new ways of putting crop into the ground, uh, new ways of harvesting, spraying, fertilizing, we build the equipment for that sort of thing. Uh, I've been doing it for the last 45 years or so, uh, quite a long while. Um, I work on the design side as well. So we do everything from going to the customer, customer says to us that we want to uh, look at uh, putting say two or three crops into the ground at once. We then look at a, a machine that can be used for them testing their idea of how they're putting it into the ground. Um, so, so I've been doing this for quite a while now. Um, we, we built machines for James Hutton, um, Roth Hampstead, uh, all over. Um, we deal with a lot with the, the, the bigger companies, the Syngentas, the KWS, uh, these sort of people. So that, that's what we do. We build the machinery for testing new types of crops. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Graham. And last but by no means least, Andrew Manfield. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I suppose I wear two hats, but my background is fundamentally as a as a background in a family farm on the Yorkshire Wolds, a um, couple of hundred hectares growing a fairly traditional mix of crops through, through um, cereals, binding peas, um, and um, a reasonable area of certified seed potatoes. Um, we also um, used to keep cattle as well, fatten cattle in that traditional way, but that's sort of become increasingly difficult to make sense of economically. So, that has implications for soil quality going forward, the, the, the fact that we're not putting the muck back that we used to do. So obviously I developed an interest in stockless systems, as you might say, for improving soil fertility. And also because we're in a nitrate vulnerable zone over a chalk aquifer, um, you know, water that we drink ourselves unfiltered straight out of our own borehole. So we had a very direct um, view on, um, on essentially on nitrogen use efficiency to sort of cut to the chase. So, so very interested in soil quality and nitrogen use efficiency. And then wearing my other hat, um, we have what I'd like to think is a um, sort of precision agriculture led machinery business, um, which is primarily about um, words, Trimble resellers. So joining those two parts of my life together, it, I've had a strong interest in developing um, cropping systems which could be improved or exploit exploit um, precision farming techniques and and hence um, you know we came into a cooperation with um, Stockbridge at Kaywood looking essentially at these um, structured plant teams which as Dave alluded to earlier brought together two elements of work that were already ongoing work that Dave had already been doing on um, on plant teams and intercropping and work that we were doing looking at um, uh, structured crops where we could do precision placement of inputs 
um, without specifically a view a view to an intercropping solution, but just really to to trying to improve um, input efficiency and see if there was a trade off to be to be had there in terms of in terms of how we worked. So we we've um, you know provided technology to STC and 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 had an input and hosted work on the farm regarding the um, the living mulches project. Excellent, thank you very much. So we've got a, a good mix there of, um, sort of machinery and actual on farm practical use of plant teams. And I must admit it was one of the things that I was very pleasantly surprised with um, when we first started the Diversify project and we started to bring together um, groups of farmers to talk to them about what the barriers might be and what some of the solutions might be. It was the fact that quite a lot of farmers were trialing these things already or had a go with and had some of those solutions already um, in mind for us. So that was extremely valuable and a key part um, at the Diversify project. Okay, moving on, we've got some, I've got some questions that have been sent in um, ahead of the meeting. And like I said, if anybody's got any um, that they want to pop into the chat box, specifically around agronomy um, and drilling um, at this point, please do so. Uh, but the first one, I get from your point of view, um, we've gone through a few of the practical challenges of plant team um, drilling and agronomy already. Which ones do you think still really need to be solved? Which ones are of, of biggest concern? I guess this goes probably to um, Andrew, Andy and, and Doug, if I turn to um, perhaps Andy first. Machinery wise, machinery wise or just in general? We, we I think really just in general, what's the, um, what are the when you're thinking about um, potentially putting a, a plant team in and you're thinking about what will be required to get it into the ground and, and manage it through the season, I guess what's the, um, the one or two things that keep you awake most at night? I think the biggest thing we don't quite know yet is the exact rate, seeding rates of and what proportions, because um, it can vary from year to year and um, vary on whatever your goal is at the start, really. Um, if we knew what the weather was going to do for the next six months, <clears throat> life would be a lot easy, a lot easier. Um, so that's that's probably that one. I think in terms of getting the seed in the ground, I think there is plenty of um, plenty of machines out there. We've only got one that can do it, but you've got Sky Drill, I'm not just to name name a few that you know, multi hopper drills are something that are becoming more common um but you don't have to be you don't have to go that expensive you showed the the um avidex applicator you can add one of them to a drill to a cultivator um you don't have to do it with expensive drills there's lots of um inventive farmers who can knock some up in the workshop that have add to their current drill so i don't think it has to be that complicated it just if it's if it's simplified it might might limit which plant teams you can grow but to make a start, I really don't think you have to spend lots of money. Excellent. Thanks very much. Doug, is that something you'd sort of agree with? Have you had any experience with working out particularly um, seed rates? Yeah, I've, I, that's, I have a problem there. Um, I've, one of the reasons for growing into crops also is to mitigate risk a bit. So um, I've had situations where I've grown beans and oats together and one year i had a really bad problem with bydv in the oats which is my own fault because i had a rye cover crop beforehand so there's a carryover of aphids so these oats just they they had to be sprayed off but at least i had a a viable crop of of beans there which was sown at the three-quarter rate um and on the flip side of the coin, I've, I've had a lot of problem with um, cleavers in beans oat mix. So I'm, I really, the cleavers are so bad, I had to take the beans out. So I had a viable crop of oats in that mix. And it's amazing how oats have the ability to um, thicken, th thicken out when the competition is not there. And um, the crop was quite good. But one of the main, one of the main crux of the matter is getting even ripening. And I want to find out more about varieties because you get the species, but you want, you can get very early maturing varieties and late maturing varieties. And um, to even to, to try to concertina the harvest together a bit more to be able to harvest them at the same time, because obviously growing peas, oats and all seed rape, the rape is quite a long way behind the peas. But it's amazing how the peas hang on. And there is, there is research to say that they do 
they do match up slightly there um, when you grow crops species different species in a in in a mix um the ripening tends to be a bit tighter between these species yeah excellent thanks very much nandra i don't know if you've got anything you'd like to add yeah i, I mean my work obviously as you know dave has been mostly with um with permanent understories and structured um teams the conclusion i've sort of tentatively come to is that the the structure might need to change from year to year to some extent it, it you know it's it's um what one, one structure isn't isn't the isn't the solution for all and that might have some implications for what particularly doug was saying because if we structure the crops differently i think to some extent we can we can affect the maturity you know, we know that if things are, are more dense or less dense, that that can have an, an implication for maturity. So, I mean, there's, I'm just, I guess, saying I've not come to firm conclusions as to what is the best structure for each situation. I think it may be different from year to year. And that structure in terms, if we're, if we're unstructured, can have implications for maturity. So maybe we can, to some extent, manipulate the maturity of those crops according to how we establish them. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, we've got one that's come in. We've got a few coming in through the um, through the chat now. One specifically um, for you, Doug, about nutrient availability. How much N would your wheat need for the yields you are expecting? I was sorry on wheat need. I haven't grown wheat oh, with wheat as a monoculture because I haven't grown wheat as a, a companion crop before. Um, but the usual. Yes, the, as a monoculture, I use I usually roughly 180 kilos a hectare of wheat. Um, on the companion crops, I've stripped the amount of nit applied nitrogen right back to between 20 and 40 kilos a hectare, and there is no there doesn't doesn't seem to be any um, with taking tissue tests there doesn't seem to be any um, lacking in, of nitrogen in the crop. And um, I've heard that the the legumes can actually push out more nitrogen. And there's there's real time nit nitrogen transfer between the legumes and the cereal part of the equation. So um, the the crop. So I wouldn't want to go any more than that on a legume based um, companion crop. And most of my companion crops are 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 predominantly the legume um, side. So for example, oats and um, beans i grow grow the beans at roughly um 70 to 80 percent seed rate mix and the cereal part of the equation the the oats at probably um 40 percent 30 to 40 percent of a full seed rate yeah fantastic so it's quite a big saving there potentially in nitrogen is that something others have seen andrew that's something you've you've looked at as well reducing um, nitrogen inputs into plant teams where you've got a legume in the mix? Yeah, I, I would say in our experience where, I mean, with the clover particularly, I would say it's easy to overstate the contribution that the clover could make. It's a, certainly one of the challenges we found. It's been a very fine balance between, between too much competition from the, you know, getting the competition balance right between the cash crop, if you like, and the, and the understory. So, I mean, clearly, the, the 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 bigger, the more vigorous the clover, the more contribution we can expect in terms of that side. And yet, at the same time, we've become very aware that we've had some we've had some rather well, I won't say unusual, but we've had some rather extreme weather patterns um, in the recent past of this um, the very wet winters where the understory <clears throat> has undoubtedly made a great contribution in terms of the the drainage and the structure of the soil the 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 trafficability and so on has been absolutely excellent and um i think there's certainly some thoughts there you know about the role that the the clover will have played let's say you know if we've got a mind to some kind of a background i came from which is you know an interest in ctf if we've got some idea about you know about some kind of traffic lanes then there's, you know, there's a great contribution to be made there in terms of trafficability and sustainability of those lanes, for example, in extreme wet conditions. And yet in summer, then the, the flip side of that is if we allow the clover to become 
too bossy, then it does undoubtedly suck moisture and compete too heavily for available resources with the with the what if with the cash crop for want of a better word. So yeah, I've I my experience is that it's a fine balancing act and therefore particularly in the work we've done we we wouldn't want to put too much emphasis on the contribution there is some but but it's not going to supply the overwhelming part of the nutrient excellent thanks so much and just i guess a, a follow-up question there from um, that rosemary's just asked does the act does the clover understory itself automatically release um n or do we actually need to stress it Um, I mean, in our experience, from what we've seen, I mean, we, we are stressing, we, we are inevitably stressing the clover as part of the system because, because what, what I would, the thing, big thing that has been a big, um, you know, a, a big learning curve for me, and I'm sure Doug would have something to say about this, is the resilience of the clover has been absolutely remarkable. You know, it, it really, we, we with a view to weed control with a view to um you know like i say reducing in crop competition have really hit that clover cart hard in you know with not just mechanical topping and so on but um, glyphosate um, um fluoroxapore products like that avidex even and and it does keep coming back by and large it will take an awful lot of hammer so i can't really comment on whether it would release it with or without stress because it's it's in my experience it's going to be stressed in these kind of systems anyway excellent thanks very much and andy have you got anything to add on um, whether you've been able to reduce the amount of energy? um my biggest experience with the intercrops has been not with the clovers we have tried the clovers um but not very successfully um, but the biggest things we do is, like Doug said, is a legume with a cereal mix. And my starting point with nitrogen is zero because the clover at the um, legume is normally the main crop. And if I start adding nitrogen to that, um, there's two things. You can make the clover, uh, the legume lazy so it doesn't nodulate. And B, you can make the uh, oats, whatever it is, um, or the wheat or the barley, you can make it too competitive and tip that fine balance. So the, what, the way I'm doing, I, my goal is to try and help the legume with the cereal. Um, so my starting point is normally zero. Um, if your goal is the cereal with a small amount of legume, then yes, you might want to add some, um, add some nitrogen, but we do some tissue tests throughout the season. And then it's amazing in the intercrops, you never see, you never see very little nitrogen deficiency um, sort of in a, but uh, a pea, pea oat or a bean oat or a lentil oat, there's, there's very little nitrogen deficiency. But I don't think, from your question on the thing, it's the, the legumes don't give up nitrogen for fun. Um, a, you do have to stress them, or B, I don't think it's just the, nit the nitrogen can be a bit misleading. It's everything else going on in the soil, the improvement in the structure, um, the improvement in the microbiome. That is more changing and rooting. That is more that's why your uh, your cereal is happier healthier in that is the, the legumes won't be giving you much nitrogen there's you know, there's there's studies to show that there's just as much nitrogen going the other way being swapped between the two from the cereals to the, to the legume so it's a bit of a bit misleading to think that the legume's just going to spend all this energy fixing all this nitrogen and then to say hey mr 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 oh there you go there's all your nitrogen i think that's that's um that's not i don't think that's what's happening um, in my opinion. Excellent. Thank you very much. We'll have one more, um, one more clover um, related question um, from Jake Freestone there. If you're structuring with an unstructured clover understory, what part of the rotation would you establish the clover in and what varieties would you use? So I guess that's a question of where you can actually, you know, do you need to take, do you need to not crop for a year to get the clover established or can you actually um, establish it at the same time um, as as producing a main crop. I'll go I'll go straight to because I know he knows the answer. Everyone <laughs> else knows the answer for the work we've done at STC and some of the work he's done at, at Hester Skew. So Andrew, any comment on that one? Yeah, um, getting the clover established um, certainly where we are. Like I say, we're we're at a bit of altitude. Um, it has been quite a challenge. Uh, there's no getting away from that. Um, 
the one the one where we've had most success by far is um, using it as a as an understory in in oilseed rape, and getting it basically established um, as either either obviously sowing it late into the previous crop, or as soon as we can after a winter barley or something like that, getting it getting it established in as soon as we can there, and then then um, well obviously we've been strip tilling oilseed rape into that and the oilseed rape obviously gives the clover a really good chance to establish in in the summer early autumn and and that has been by far in our experience the most successful just just one comment i mean i we have had problems with getting really good consistent establishment of clover and that could be due to the quality of the seed the clover seed we've had we think that might have been a bit inconsistent um we we haven't got a lot of experience of, of you know different varieties of particular types of clover um and i do just have a thought as to whether there is a given that clover seed is not the cheapest thing whether there is a place for using um, um zonal sowing if you like to top the clover mix up if you're looking to do an understory to try and top it up season after season you know where you've got maybe 70 percent of the area is well established you've got 30 percent with less establishment putting extra seed on in those poorly established areas in following following years you know using a kind of variable rate system might have a method might have a role rather excellent thank you very much anybody else got any comments on that one uh, I, yeah, I've um, had many failures of trying to get clover established. Um, one my Nuffield scholarship, the one successful one that I did see was in all seed rape, as Andrew has said. Uh, but we've tried in spring oats, it worked one year, and the next year it failed completely. I think because the spring oats were too competitive, um, and they just shaded out the clover. Um, this year we tried in spring beans, um, and that's been relatively successful. Um, but I'll know more in a month or so when I see what's in the wheat um, once it comes back. But um, for me, getting clover established has been difficult. And as I think there's slugs is an issue. I also think residual herbicides in your previous crop can be an issue as well. Um, so I always see the organic guys seem to get their clover established a lot better than we do in conventional. And I think, I think the um, you know, residual chemistry probably does have something to do with, to do with that. Uh, and, and possibly the competition um, from the crop in conventional and the nitrogen that's actually applied could possibly suppress the clover in the establishment phases. Excellent, thanks very much. Yeah, the, the work with STC we used, I think it was um, Aberpearl was the variety there because it was one that would keep, we knew it would keep very low and compact. And the other crop we had some success with was um, maize. It seemed to establish quite well under maize, but again, I don't know if that was just the, the particular year that we'd, um, we've done that trial it was only done over one year graham i'm very aware that we haven't haven't come to you yet at all um so i'm wondering in terms of i mean something i've certainly noticed um with some of the particularly some of the participatory farmers we had within the diversify project um was that some of the solutions to some of the issues around well both both drilling i suppose and agronomy to an extent but particularly i will probably talk later around harvest they were sort of doing bits where they were tweaking their own um, machinery to come up with bespoke solutions. Is that something that's possible to do almost commercially? So it sounds like you're coming up with um, and you're sort of designing and building trials equipment with bespoke um, adaptions. Have you ever done anything or could you do anything around if there was a, a market for it? Yeah, I mean, uh, as Andrew Howard said at the beginning, I mean, there is a lot of equipment out there that uh, especially now, I mean, I've been in it long enough to know that uh, in the early years, a lot of combination drilling used to be done. Um, we've noticed over the last four or five years that there's more combination drilling coming back into the system. So a lot of the, the drill manufacturers have been building drills with two hoppers that will allow you to put two different crops on at the same time. Um, and I think that it, it's not that expensive way of looking at it, you can go for secondhand machinery, you can refurbish it, you can modify it to, to do what you want. Um, I wouldn't have said it's it's looking for something new. A lot of the things that we build nowadays, it's more through our experience of what we've seen in the past 
on the way things have been done, that you can bring an old idea back in again that you may be done 30, 40 years ago, you can see, all right, okay, we can look at that and modify it slightly. So I think there's a lot of machinery out there that, you know, it can just be tweaked a bit, as you say. Uh, it's not needing something de redesigning or anything like that. It's more just looking at what's out there and how it can be slightly modified to, to fit uh, the demands that are needed. Excellent. Yeah. And I guess a, a bit of a follow up question um, from Innes. Uh, do you think um, that CAP or the UK equivalent, I get that what we're seeing at the moment with Elms, could subsidise changes in equipment that would be needed for intercropping? Do you think that would help? Um, I don't know, really. I mean, uh, I, I would have said, you know, I mean, machinery we found certainly on our side, on the trial side, um, capital expenditure hasn't really changed as much because of the Brexit side of things. I think we will see there'll be a lot more equipment hopefully built in the UK. Uh, we are finding that we're getting asked for a lot more equipment rather than buying it from outside the UK to, to produce it within uh, the UK now. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that there will be a drop off in machinery, I think, over the next year or two, but it, it'll, it'll come back in again. Excellent, thank you. And Andrew, I don't know if you want to comment on that with the work. And I guess the other part that's quite interesting, one of the questions we have, um, we have sort of here, the looking at the different bits of machinery that you might need um, across a across a growing season to to produce a plant team. How easy and is it getting easier um, for that machinery to communicate with each with each other effectively? Yeah, um, the, a couple of things. Um, I mean, obviously, the 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 um, the grants that have been available in the recent past um, have been quite heavily tilted towards um, um, both technology and um, um, minimal disturbance establishment techniques. You know the small grant scheme that which is just playing out its final phase now. You know offered quite substantial um, grants for for direct drills and um, less substantial but still useful for for technology and i i believe the the gist of um of elms is that there's going to be fewer direct support payments and more we can expect more grants for the adoption of technology um, both with a view to improving soil quality just as a general category but also um you know to re reduce the dependence on on labor because um, you know um, labour force is, is going to be reduced. We think we know that. Well, we do know that. So, so the, undoubtedly, the, I think there will be opportunities to invest um, for those who who wish to, you know, um, shall we say, commit, you know, to that approach. Um, in terms of um, communicate, well, in 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 terms of um, versatility and flexibility of equipment. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, absolutely we we are to a certain extent reinventing the wheel in terms of the the mechanization side because you know we the a lot of these techniques that we're talking about today in a, in a perhaps a greater depth and with a more scientific approach are obviously a techniques that were used that my father and my grandfather would have recognized to some extent and um it, it you know there is nothing new under the sun to that extent um but but yeah i i I, I, always, I think this is quite an interesting area and perhaps a discussion for another day to what extent the very large dedicated machines that a lot of money is invested in today, essentially with a view to the production of monocultures, are going to become to some extent white elephants going forward because we know that they are arguably economically efficient at the moment, but we know they also have huge implications for soil structure in terms of damage. Um, you know, they're quite often quite dedicated to particular crops and so on. So just as a general point, I would say that we're likely to see a move towards perhaps, perhaps smaller equipment again and perhaps more versatile equipment. In terms of interoperability of, of equipment, um, the obvious one at the moment, you know, is the ISOBUS standard does seem to be finally becoming 
accepted across the industry. So that is that is on a, on a, on a simple level, that is a very good thing because, um, you know, it is a bit of a nightmare if you're looking to, you know, do things like variable rate application and, and control multiple hoppers and so on at the same time. There's a lot to be said for the ISOBUS standard as a, as, as a, as a catch-all solution. Excellent, many thanks. You've actually sort of, sort of answered the next question on there as well, which is, do you think there will be a role for, as we start to move towards smaller, perhaps more autonomous um, machinery, um, do you think there'll be a role for some of the, the sort of farm bot type systems that we'll see, we might see coming through in the future, the, at least for certain types of future farming systems that can do things almost on a, a sort of plant by plant level? I guess I'm thinking sort of a small robot company type um, type systems. Yeah, but I think you probably um, you probably answered that one there, as we've spoken about. Um, uh, yeah, potentially using smaller and smaller uh, machines for certain tasks, at least. Um, a question that we've got, and we've got, I've just spotted a question from um, Anna about harvest. You'll have to hang on until the the next session to get that one answered, Anna. But we will. That will be something we'll look at um, in the after after coffee. Uh, I've got one here that's been sent in ahead of the meeting. And I guess it's for the it will be for, for those of you that are actually growing plant teams at the moment. Where have you gone or where would you go to seek advice on intercropping, plant team cropping? I guess if we start with Doug, perhaps for that one. Um, read Andy Howard's Nuffield Scholarship. <laughs> it's as good a start as anywhere because that's what inspired me to give it a go as well. Um, but also some, some research organizations, I don't know whether Newcastle are doing, but certainly James Hutton are. Um, I don't know about SRUC, but um, there, but also there's a huge amount of information out on the social media as, media as well. And um, um, joining Base UK would be a good start because there's a huge amount of um, knowledge there on conservation agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say. Yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. Andy, I'm assuming you've read your own Nuffield report. Where else might you go for um, that sort of um, I get there is lots of stuff on the, on the internet, scientific papers, past papers. I mean, some of the ideas I came up with were from the 1930s, sort of the linseed with the oats as a companion crop. That was from the 1930s. Um, so a lot of Googling, yeah, join Base UK, read look at the diversify and, and the remix websites you know the, the the knowledge is increasing rapidly it is an area that you know five years ago when i was doing my nuffield then my father sort of laughed at me sort of saying why are you doing that subject um but now it's you know it's like cover cropping 10 years ago i was laughed at when i started planting cover crops and now everyone's um there's a lot of research and everyone's doing it. i think it's the same is with intercropping um but um, yeah, I just yeah, obviously my Nuffield report is very good. Um, I think <laughs> I need to read it again because I've forgotten half of it because it took me long enough to write. Um, but there's a lot of information out there, and there's a lot of links from my Nuffield that you can link to different people, different institutions, um, and go from there. And it is free if you're looking for my Nuffield report. Same as every Nuffield report, it's free on the Nuffield International website. You can download it from there, so it's not going to cost you anything. Fantastic, many thanks. You should try to get a, a pound a copy or something. There, we could have. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, go thinking about that and thinking about the the. I've um, got a question on lots of good input from the the US potentially. When you were doing your Nuffield, did you pick up whether any certain parts of the world where um, you thought they were actually they you know, here they're they're quite far ahead and quite well advanced with with intercropping, and this is a good sort of geographic um, to learn from. It was it was a case of I went you know I did North America uh africa um where else did i um, try to think where else i went but actually the most useful information was um in europe you know in france they're doing um quite a bit um luckily i've got some good contacts there's some good information in france sweden um denmark um germany you know there is the, the stuff that's most useful it, i found was the stuff that was, was close to home um you know, you can look at the stuff that's happening in North Dakota or Texas, which is great, but um, it's not necessarily that translatable to the um, UK conditions. So you don't have to go very far across the pond, across the um, channel to um, 
find some really interesting farmers and researchers doing some good stuff. And there's a lot, there's a lot in the UK. I mean, that's why when I started looking, you know, it didn't realize how many people do play around with this stuff and have done for years in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much. And thanks to Charlotte. She's popped a link to your um, Nuffield scholarship there in the chat for anybody that wants to look at it. So if anyone that downloads it, if you can send a pound um, to Andy, that'd be great. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, and I guess following on from that, I think there's, there's a, there, is my right in saying there's an intercropping innovative farmers group now as well? I think I've come across that one, yes. That's... There is, yes. It's, mm, it is there. It hasn't, we haven't done much since COVID um, <laughs> and we'll see how that, but yeah, no, that's free to join as well. Um, and I'm not, Charlotte would be the best one to speak to on any future plans for that. I'm just waiting for Charlotte to up a link to that up as well in the chat there. I'm sure yeah, she'll yeah. <laughs> be on to it. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, if, I don't know if you've got any comments to make on that one as well around where you would go to access um, advice. Oh, um, just draw the internet sort of late into the night. That's, that's um, I, I would say if I was going to say anything, it's the important thing, I think, is to keep an open mind. That's, that's you know, it's, it's very easy to sort of become siloed, you know, and and dismiss something just because you know it's it slightly um because one element of somebody's practices goes against what you believe is the right way to go if i can put it that way it doesn't mean there aren't other things to be learned from it and if i was to sort of generalize one of the problems dare i say with the sort of um sustainable agriculture movement if i can put it that way is that it's tend to become a bit siloed and and it it, it, it isn't it's broad minded in some ways, but quite narrow minded in others. And I do think it's important to keep an open mind about all practices that, that go on. So that, that would just be my comment on that. And, and Google is your friend, obviously. Excellent. Right. Thanks so much. We're almost at the end of our first um, panel discussion. I think the last question, which is a bit more of a, I guess, a, a broad um, broad brush question. But is there and I, again, this will go to the, the, the those of you that are actually growing um, uh, into crops at the moment if you could pick out one driver the one thing that, that's, that's attracted you I know, I know it's probably not a case that it's just one thing but the main the main um, driver that has, has led you down the road of, of starting to grow um, plant teams what would that what would that be um, so I guess just very quickly almost one or two um, words from everyone starting with let's go with Doug um, try to insert more diversity in my rotation um, and it gives a platform to be able to reduce synthetic inputs quite considerably. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Andy? Oh, you're still on mute, Andy. Sorry, I did press a button, but obviously not well enough. Um, two things for me would be, um, would be resilience, as in spreading the risk like Doug does. Um, so for us, the break crops are normally our poorest payers. Um, if you can, if you can reduce, if you can even up those margins across the farm, that's one major thing. And the second one is much more fun. Um, a, field, a field of wheat that you've spent a fortune on growing, and then it doesn't rain for three months is fairly, fairly, fairly dull. But um, growing an intercrop is, I find, much more exciting. And Andrew. Sustainable profit in every sense of the two words. Yeah, it's just become increasingly challenging we've found in commercial agriculture to carry on as we did before, in short. So we, we have to look at new techniques. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, I think that takes us, as usual with me, I've gone over slightly um, over the time that I've been yeah, sort of given. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting and useful session. Uh, we're now going to break um, I think it's 20 minutes for, um, yep, 20 minutes for coffee. So we'll come back um, at 50, 40. I was hoping just before we all left to try and sort of thank the panellists there, whether our um, rogue AV, who are controlling everything behind the scenes, might be able to unmute everybody's microphone. We could, we could try a, a large group remote round of applause. I'm not sure how that would go, but I think we could, uh, let's give it a try. So thanks, thanks very much to the panel. Just hear myself clapping. There's a few, a few other people as well. Excellent.
Good. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you back at um, 1540, the afternoon session.